Hi everybody, big warm welcome to all of you. It's our date for Tea at the Ritz. It's the end of the week, I can't believe it, but it is. And uh, you're all very welcome to join me here and uh, I'm delighted to have your company. Um, I don't know whether you caught the Zoom call with Annette Badland on Tuesday, but it was brilliant. She's a wonderful woman and um, she made a really interesting comment during that about how this enforced lockdown had given her time to think about her home and uh, how she's normally touring and away a lot and it's given her a different appreciation of um, where she lives and uh, how much she enjoys being at home in fact. So I wonder how you've been feeling during lockdown about your home. I've certainly uh, for myself seen it as a place of like a safe harbour in a way, you know, with that storm raging outside my front door of the virus and being able to shut my door and uh, stay home and stay safe. And I think we associate the concept of home with a fair degree of security and safety. And that's certainly been true during this pandem pandemic. Um, what it's also given me is an opportunity to really appraise uh, my home and think long and hard about the future. I suppose for all of us there's a certain level of dread in the words retirement home or old people's home um, and in a way where we're living now may determine the likelihood of us ending up uh, in a retirement home or some kind of specialist accommodation for the very elderly. Now, um, as I said, that fills quite a lot of us with dread and um, I for one would like to avoid that uh, for as long as I possibly can and certainly this prolonged uh, um, time at home has given me all sorts of thoughts and ideas about what I want to do um, in order to make sure that I stay here for as long as I possibly can. So. What is home? Let's ask that very simple question. What do we mean when we say home? Um, I suppose it's a number of very different things. Um, I was born and brought up in Suffolk and lived the first 18 years of myself at home with my parents, brother, next door to my grandmother, uh, father and grandfather and also cousins. So the first 18 years of my life was all spent in the same place and um, was very happy and secure, I have to say. Uh, my parents got married in 1939 and moved after the war into a new house where they lived for the rest of their lives. They never went anywhere else. So for them, home was extremely uh, stable in the sense that uh, they, always lived, uh, they always lived in the same place. And I suppose uh, it was an accumulation over a very long period of time of many, many uh, memories and associations and so on and so forth which hasn't been true for me because during my 72 years I've actually lived in 10 different places that I've called home and it has given me a much more profound understanding of what home means. So the first thing is, uh, is home just about people? Is it about the fact that a place is associated with those people that you love and that you want to be with and does it not really matter where you are or um, you know what the bricks and mortar are like as long as you're with the right people. Well I'm not so sure because I actually live alone now so my home is not associated with people and yet I do think of it as home and um, I do feel safe and secure there so I don't think it's just about people. Uh, is it about the bricks and mortar? Well it can be because I've had one or two places where I've lived that I haven't really liked the physical structure of the place. Um, one in particular was, was, was not very nice at all. So I do think that the, the way that the, the place that you live is actually um, made makes a difference. Uh, is it about geographical location? Well, maybe, uh, maybe not, I don't know. Um, not long after I got married, whenever I said to my husband, uh, you know, shall we go home next weekend, he'd always know that I meant going back to that geographical place, which was where my parents were. So again, is home associated with, with a particular place? 
is it is it is it actually a place which you associate with some kind of memories and associations which are important to you and that imbues that place with a sense of being home um, so I think it's a combination of all of those things. It is about safety and security. It is about memories and associations. It is about location. It can be about bricks and mortar. And it can also very much be about uh, somewhere that uh, holds those people that uh, are important to you. As I said, I've had 10 different homes in my life. And it's it's really in contemplation of the places that I haven't felt were a, a proper home to me that makes me understand what I need uh, in order to feel at home somewhere. Uh, the first place was uh, was uh, uh, actually abroad. It was a different country where I felt very, very, very unhappy, uncomfortable and dislocated. Uh, my uh, I was still married at that time. My then husband's job moved to Sweden. And this is not a, a story against Sweden at all. Sweden is a lovely place full of uh, really charming people. It's a very sophisticated place. And we had a very beautiful apartment there. <clears throat> but I can honestly say that uh, for the first time in my life, I was incredibly homesick. I just didn't want to be there. And every morning I'd wake up with this knot in my stomach, this feeling of dread that uh, I was in this place and uh, it didn't feel at all like home. And, uh, and as I said, I felt incredibly homesick. It was associated with a lot of um, complicated things that were going on in my life at that time. Um, my marriage was not in a very happy place. I had one daughter in school in Stockholm. The other daughter was at school in England. And so I felt that the family was split up. And as I said, my marriage was coming to an end. So it's not really surprising that I found it difficult to settle in Stockholm. And I, I would never have called it home for sure. Um, the second time that I felt that uh, that sense that this is not a home, it might be a place where I'm living, but it doesn't feel like a home, was not long after I did get divorced. And uh, I bought a flat quite quickly. It was a ground, uh, it was a first floor flat, so there was no garden. It was a modern building. It wasn't particularly uh, prepossessing. It was... Um, it was a bit cold, a bit sterile. I don't think I decorated it particularly successfully. And it, you know what? It was just a place to go when I finished work. Um, and I waited until my younger daughter actually left school when I moved into London and actually did buy somewhere that felt a lot more like home. I made a second, uh, a, a, another mistake um, of buying a flat quite quickly, not long after my daughter came down from university and She'd done some travelling as well. She needed somewhere to live and I had a whole house with three bedrooms and I just kept thinking, I don't need this whole house. She needs somewhere to live and living back with me wasn't proving to be 100% uh, successful, let's put it that way, after five years away um, at, uh, at university and travelling. So I just decided to uh, sell this house and buy two flats, one in which uh, my daughter could live. Um, I didn't give her that flat, by the way. It was just somewhere that she could live. And the other one where I could... Um, uh, where I could live, but almost within 20, 48 hours of buying this uh, this flat, which was just down the road from the house that I'd had in Chiswick, I realised I'd made a terrible mistake and that, in fact, I didn't like living there at all. Um, I, the ground floor was uh, occupied by somebody, an old man who was a recluse and he was a bit odd and strange and the back garden was filled with junk and rubbish and foxes and I just felt incredibly uncomfortable there and uh, as I said 48 hours after buying it I thought oh dear I don't think I can live here for too much longer. Anyway meantime I'd been watching a lot a uh, fair amount of Homes Under the Hammer, um, a programme about all auctions and buying at auction and I just thought oh yes I'd like to do that so I was visiting a friend here in Wimbledon and uh, uh, driving down this road where I now live and saw the sign outside saying for sale by auction so I came and saw this place that was running with damp and we'd had holes in the floor and uh, it was uh, it was in the most incredibly uh, dilapidated state but it had all the boxes ticked that I wanted to be ticked so uh, it had its own front door it had um 
quite a nice garden and it also had um, a nice size garden. It also had a room at the back that I could turn into a, a, a lovely, bright, sunny living room with a double door garden, you know, bifold uh, doors onto the garden. So I thought I can make this into a beautiful home. And I think that is really what I've created over the last uh, 15 years or so since I moved in here. I obviously bought this place at auction. I had it completely renovated. And of course, by renovation, by renovating it, it became mine. You know, it was my choice in the kitchen, my choice in the bathroom. And not long after uh, it was finished, I decided to sell the flat in Chiswick that I really didn't like very much and um, move in here. And I'm so glad that I did because finally, after uh, about 15 years of being divorced, I found a place that I could call home and that I wanted to be. So this uh, in terms of geographical location was perfect. It was a lovely uh, building. It's a, an attractive place to live. It's a great location. Um, and although I, I don't have, you know, I've built my own memories up um, over time and I don't live here with anybody, <clears throat> it does feel like home to me. And it is safe and secure and it is a place that I actually want to be. So I think that uh, I've got somewhere that I don't need to move on from. But during lockdown, I've given quite a lot of consideration to how I need to adapt it slightly um, in order to future proof it. And I've got a couple of projects that I'm going to, uh, to carry out over the next uh, maybe two or three years. And it's my way of ensuring that I can stay here in the longer term, even if I become uh, slightly more incapacitated, let's, say, let's put it that way, than I am now. Um, I've got a couple of stories about friends who I think have taken incredibly brave decisions to prove uh, future proof their lives and um, they did it at, uh, at at a relatively young age. Uh, the first are a couple who uh, were in their well they just turned 70 and the um, my friend said to her husband I don't want to die having never lived in Cornwall which is quite a bold statement isn't it so he said well if you feel that strongly then we'll you know we're gonna have to go down to Cornwall and see if we can find somewhere to live so they were living just outside London they had um, children around them um, and they you know up sticks and found a lovely place in Cornwall on the coast and they moved down there they've been down there about three or four years now and they absolutely love it got a couple of dogs they walk on the beach and um, they've got a nice garden and they've made themselves um, very at home there by joining in uh, with the community, by getting to know people, by making new friendships. So they've m made that move very successfully. And I'm full of admiration for them because I don't think it's a particularly easy decision to move to a you know one end of the country to another. But they did so for very good reasons. And uh, it has proved to be uh, a, a great success. And I say good on them. The other story is about a friend who, uh, with her husband, was living in a house with a garden and they decided that they really wanted to live in the centre of Brighton, not very far away from where they were living, but um, a place that they uh, they loved going to for the cultural life, for the, for the, um, for the shops, for the, the energy of the place and also, of course, it's on the coast. So um, they decided to buy a retirement flat and their friends were horrified. It's like, what on earth are you buying? You know, it's full of old people. Why would you buy a retirement flat full of old people at your age? They were in their late 60s at the time. But that is what they decided to do. And again, very successfully. So uh, it was spurred on by Penny's experience with her own mother who had died in the family house that was crammed with stuff that uh, her mum and dad had accumulated over a very long uh, marriage. And it took Penny the best part of a year of going up and down the motorway to try and sort out all this, um, I say, accumulated stuff from her parents' lives um, before she, the house could be sold. And she said... To me, it was a real lesson in what I do not want to impose on my children. So she and her husband have um, edited their lives down. They've um, 
they've they've given lots of stuff away to charity shops and so on they've sold stuff and they now live much more simply and with much less stuff in a retirement flat and uh, they love it they love it because it's where they want to live but it's also how they want to live and they are now uh, again they're, they're comfortable and secure in the knowledge that when something happens to them they are not leaving this legacy to their children of a whole load of accumulated uh, stuff that has to be sorted out. Um, so I don't know what stay, uh, stage of your lives you're at, um, whether you've had any of these thoughts down lockdown, uh, during lockdown yourselves or whether you're very happy where you are and uh, you see that as being the place that you want to live uh, for as long as you possibly can. As I said, um, I've had 10 different uh, places that I've lived in my life. Some of them I would have said were real homes to me uh, and some were definitely not. I'm happy to say that I've now, at, uh, at my age, early 70s, um, found a place to uh, uh, to, to, to lay my head that I want to be um, and it ticks as I said my geographical location box I suppose place and people from the point of view of being very near to my children and grandchildren and it is a lovely place to live um, and it has got some beautiful memories and associations and it does feel very safe and secure so uh once I've made my small adjustments that I'm going to make uh, over the next two or three years, I think it is a place that I can hopefully live, I would like to say, for the rest of my life. Uh, my neighbour Rose next door to me uh, died uh, in that uh, apartment next door, flat next door, at the age of 94, so she managed to stay put. So I would love to think that uh, I'd be able to do the same. So I do hope you found that interesting and uh, maybe uh, stimulated some thoughts or ideas uh, for, for you about uh, how you want your lives to be in the future. And, uh, and what does home mean to you? And I'm going to finish with a poem. I'm taking it from this, uh, this book, Dancing by the Light of the Moon, again. And um, it's, it's called Getting Older. So I've been musing on, uh, you know, home in relationship to getting older. And this is rather a nice poem. It's by Elaine Feinstein. So the first surprise, I like it. Whatever happens now, some things that used to terrify have not. I didn't die young, for instance, or lose my only love. My three children never had to run away from anyone. Don't tell me this gratitude is complacent. We all approach the edge of the same blackness, which for me is silent. Knowing as much sharpens my delight in January freesia, hot coffee, winter sunlight. So we say, as we lie close on some gentle occasion, every day one from such darkness is a celebration. I'm sorry for the phone ringing there. Um, it's ruined the end of my talk, but uh, hopefully it didn't ruin that poem for you. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, being with me for the last 20 minutes or so. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. I uh, hope the weather's reasonable where you are. And I shall very much look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. See you then. And thank you for listening and watching. Bye bye.